Uh, yeah, I hope that you're hearing me. Uh-huh. This is the future, all about cybersecurity. Talking about the hackers, I'm just trying to warn you. From the one and only legend, the cyber informer. Hey, yeah, yeah, this is the cyber reformer. Uh, this is the cyber reformer. Let's go. It's time for the Cybersecurity Business Connect and Protect Central Coast Q&A video. I'm Michael Tremblett, the Cyber Informer, and today we'll be answering the question, what is social engineering? In celebration of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we want to make sure you're aware of all the threats to your business. In this video, we'll look at social engineering and the different attacks hackers perform in order to get what they want from you and your business. Let's go. What is social engineering? The answer according to Google is the use of deception to manipulate individuals into divulging confidential or personal information that may be used for fraudulent purposes. In other words, social engineering is the art of manipulating a person or a group of people into providing information or a service they otherwise would never have given. The purpose of this video is to inform you of the many different ways hackers can use social engineering to take advantage of people. As you watch this video, make a mental note. How many of these methods have you seen? How many have you not seen? How many would you have fallen for because you weren't aware they were a thing? Let's have a look at the many aspects of social engineering. Why does social engineering work? There are a number of reasons why social engineering works. These are human nature in trusting others. How many times have you given personal information because you trust the person? Ignorance of social engineering efforts. This is probably the most common. People give information out because they are not aware they are being socially engineered. Fear. How many times have you been questioned for information from a superior and you have given information you probably shouldn't have because you feared for your job or the consequences of not giving out information? What if someone used that fear by impersonating a superior to get information out of you? Greed. I think we've all seen the promise of riches from the Nigerian prince email scams. The promise of easy money is always enticing, especially when there is a plausible story. A sense of moral obligation. Someone might provide information because they feel it is right to do so, rather than considering the legal or privacy concerns. This isn't just handing over information. It could be holding an otherwise locked door open for someone who has their hands full, and that someone shouldn't be there. This one maybe not so much in small business, because everyone typically knows everyone else in the business. But what about in an enterprise or in a campus where you can't know everyone or what access they should have? This is an example of someone who is an inside attacker without even knowing they are one. Welcome to the nightmare that is social engineering. What allows social engineering to happen? Insufficient training. Do your staff know what information should be kept private? Are they aware of authorised people or third parties they can share information with? Are they aware of social engineering practices hackers employ? All of these are factors in staff training. Unregulated information or physical access. Does an unauthorized person have access to the shared drive where you keep confidential files? What about the filing cabinet that stores employee information? Both logical and physical security need to be implemented to protect data. Complex organizational structure. Not usually a problem in small business, however it can be a problem when management changes occur or as the business grows. Lack of security policies. Not having clear security policies is also a factor in people being socially engineered. If you don't have clear policies, any request in a grey area may mean the person being asked the question will divulge the information. In small and medium business, insufficient training and lack of security policies are the most common, followed by unregulated information access, then organisational structure complexity. Social engineering falls into one of three categories, human-based, computer-based, mobile-based. We'll pick apart all three categories in this video. Just like everything else in the hacking world, social engineering has a framework. Social engineering is a non-technical method of attacking systems, which means it's not limited to people with technical know-how. It's simple, effective, and near impossible to contain. The stages of an attack are 1. Research, dumpster dive, visit websites, tour the company, etc. 2. Select a victim. Identify frustrated employee or other promising targets. Three. Develop a relationship. Four, exploit the relationship. Collect sensitive information. Phase one, research. Dumpster diving, or trash int, or trash intelligence, involves going through dumpsters, paper recycling bins, and office trash cans, which can provide a wealth of information, 
like written down passwords, sensitive documents, access lists, personally identifiable information, and so on. This is why the federal government recommends any confidential information is stored in locked cabinets. And when disposing of sensitive information, it is shredded or otherwise destroyed or disposed of in locked recycling bins. Visit websites or public social media. This is OSINT or Open Source Intelligence. This is the practice of collecting information from published or otherwise publicly available sources. Do you have a website with an Our Team page? Does it show positions in the business so a business hierarchy can be inferred? What about the public information on Facebook or LinkedIn? This is all gold for hackers who can use this information to launch attacks. Have you ever toured a company? Have you ever given anyone a tour of your company? Floor plans, camera locations, server infrastructure rooms and more can be noted during business tours. In a future video, we will talk more about physical security. Phase 2. Select the victim. Identify frustrated employee. The malicious insider is a huge threat to all businesses. Who has posted or seen frustrated posts about a workday on social media? What about that person who has had a bad attitude that no one wants to work with? How about the latest threat I discussed in podcast episode 4, Daily Backups, where hackers are paying initial access brokers to gain access to networks? All of these are possible ins for hackers. Other promising targets may include that overly friendly receptionist who may be able to be manipulated. The new employee who may not be aware of all the business procedures could become a target of a specially crafted email. A little bit of knowledge and some coercion could be all it takes to get someone in your business socially engineered. A social engineer will manipulate their target using email, phone, or in-person tactics to acquire confidential information. Through observing personal mentalities, recurring routines, and relationships, the social engineer can develop an appearance of an individual you might naturally trust. For example, have you had a contractor or tradie come into the business who you instantly like because they're smiling, being more personable and willing to have a chat? These friendly people are much easier to trust than the abrasive or quiet contractor. People who are trying to socially engineer you will have these instantly likable traits. The faster they can build a relationship or trust, the faster they can exploit it. This excerpt has been taken directly from the Hacker's Handbook. Studies have shown People will assume a good-looking person is more intelligent and be more apt to provide them with assistance. Humor and great personality and a smile-while-you-talk voice can take you far in social engineering. People want to help and assist you. Most of us are hardwired that way, especially if you are pleasant. After social engineers obtain the trust of their unsuspecting victims, they exploit the relationship and coax the victims into divulging more information than they should. Once they have the information they are after, they can then attack. We'll talk about human-based social engineering. How many of these have you heard of? We've already talked about dumpster diving or trash int, which involves going through dumpsters, paper recycling bins, and office trash cans, which can provide a wealth of information. Impersonation is the most popular form of social engineering. The social engineer pretends to be someone they are not, and that person is something the target either respects, fears, or trusts. Examples of these could be an employee, a valid user, a repairman, an executive, a help desk person, an IT security expert, policeman. Pretending to be a person of authority introduces intimidation and fear, which sometimes works well on lower level employees, convincing them to assist in gaining access to a system or really anything you want. Why not call a help desk and ask them to reset the password of the target? Another version of this attack is called authority support. Vishing or voice phishing is using a phone during a social engineering effort. Have you received any phone calls from Microsoft where they say they can tell you have a virus on your computer and you need to give them access to your system? Anna, in this month's special podcast, episode 6, had someone calling her to say her home internet was going to get cut off. Her home internet isn't in her name. That's vishing. Shoulder surfing simply looks over the shoulder of a person as they log in or enter an access code or alarm code. It can even be done at long distance by using binoculars. Think about it when you're disarming your building alarm. Could someone be shoulder surfing you? Eavesdropping, which is overhearing conversations. It's amazing what people will talk about openly when they feel they're in a safe place. Tailgating, normally used on campuses or in larger organizations. An attacker uses a fake badge and follows an authorized person through the open security door. Piggybacking. Again, normally used on campuses or in larger organizations, an attacker doesn't have a badge but asks for someone to let them in anyway. 
RFID identity theft, sometimes called RFID skimming, is another one which is normally used on campuses, larger organisations or even in buildings that use RFID swipe cards or fobs for you to gain access. This attack steals your identity using an RFID skimming device by being in close proximity to your RFID badge or credit card, etc. If you tap your credit card to pay, these days you'd be familiar with this. This uses RFID to communicate with the FPOS terminal. RFID skimmers can be used just by walking past people with exposed credit cards. They sell RFID card wallets to protect against this sort of attack. Reverse social engineering is where you get the target to call you with the information. Specific steps are taken to pull this off. Advertise. The attacker advertises or markets his position as technical support of some kind. Sabotage. The attacker performs some sort of sabotage, such as pull cables or a sophisticated DOS attack. We haven't talked about DOS attack so far. DOS stands for Denial of Service, or DOS, which attacks availability in the security CIA triad. A DOS attack on the internet will typically point a large amount of internet traffic at your internet connection, overwhelming it and taking it offline. Support. The attacker attempts to help by asking for login credentials and gaining access to the system. Reverse social engineering points out a truth in the security world. Inside to outside communication is always more trusted than outside to inside communication. An example of a reverse social engineering attack is an email will go to employees with a fake help desk number stating that there could be issues tomorrow on the network. The attacker performs a denial of service attack and waits for users to call. The attacker states, yes, I can fix this for you, but hand over your ID and password and I can get you sorted out. The user hands over their username and password. The attacker ends the denial of service attack. The internet connection starts working again. The user is happy, the problem is resolved, and the hacker is happy because they have the user's login details. Easy. Malicious insider attack. You trust them and they already have access, credentials, information, and resources to do their job. If one of them goes rogue or decides they want to inflict damage, there isn't a lot you can do about it. They could spy for the opposition, or if they wanted to burn the whole thing down, they could and you couldn't stop it. A disgruntled employee, someone who is angry with the circumstances and situations around their duties, the organization itself, or even the people they work with, has the potential to do some serious harm to the bottom line. There are multiple insider attacks. Negligent insider is not someone who is purposely being malicious, they just choose lax security and the easiest path. Professional insider is one specifically looking to exploit his insight for personal gain. This coupled with the aforementioned initial access broker can be a dangerous combination. Hacker employed. What if the hacker gets employed? They sit the interview and get offered the job. They can take a couple of months to set things up and attack you without you knowing or suspecting that was their intent in going for the job in the first place. Those were all the human-based social engineering attacks. What about computer-based social engineering attacks? Social network, one of the best means for people to communicate with one another and to build relationships to help further personal and professional goals. This also provides hackers with plenty of information on which to build an attack profile. For example, on Facebook, you can get date of birth, address, education information, employment background, and relationships with other people. LinkedIn provides that and more, including specialities and skills the person has, as well as peers they know and work with. Phishing is the simplest and most common method of computer-based social engineering. A phishing attack involves crafting an email that appears legitimate, but in fact contains links to fake websites or to download malicious content. The email can appear to come from a bank, credit card company, utility company, or any other number of legitimate business interests a person may work with. The link contained within the email leads the user to a fake web form in which the information is entered and saved for the hacker's use. Phishing can either be really good, such as perfect spelling, using insider information like specific clients or projects or known names of people. This is likely a targeted attack. Or phishing can be really bad with poor spelling and more interest in personal areas of your life which is likely just trying to get another bot added to the hacker's botnet. We haven't spoken directly about botnet so far, but if you go and listen to the podcast episode 3, we suspect a botnet was responsible for Gabby's Facebook hack. Phishing can be prevented by good perimeter email filters, but the best way to defend against phishing is user education. The following points indicate a phishing email and items that can be checked for legitimacy of the email. Beware unknown, unexpected, or suspicious originators. If you don't know the entity or person sending the email, treat it cautiously. Even if the email is from someone or an entity you know, but the content is out of place or unsolicited, 
It's still something to be cautious about. Check the from address is from the company, not a random site. Beware of who the email is addressed to. An indicator could be the to field or the opening greeting. They generally won't address you personally in the greeting, instead provide a blanket greeting like dear sir or whom it may concern. Verify phone numbers. Check any phone numbers that are on the email. Look up the number on the website and call the number to see if it exists. Beware of bad spelling or grammar. Emails from big companies are not going to have spelling mistakes or bad grammar, like verbs out of tense. Always check links. Many phishing emails point to bogus websites. Simply changing a letter or two in the link, adding or removing a letter, changing the O to a zero or an L to a one completely changes the DNS lookup check. Hovering your mouse over the link will show you where the link is actually going. In the next video, I will walk you through the federal government's phishing email test. This has some great information on how to spot phishing emails and text messages. Spear phishing is like phishing, but it is usually a targeted attack against an individual or multiple users within an organization. Spear phishing is usually as a result of a little reconnaissance work to find out information about a business. This is made a lot easier if you have your team on your website. Whaling is a high level executive spear phishing attack. Usually the owner, management or chief executive level is targeted in these attacks. Farming is the use of malicious code of some sort that redirects a user's web traffic also known as phishing without a lure. Spimming, using instant messaging to send spam messages. You may see these unsolicited messages on social media. Pop-up windows. Pop-up windows will tell you that you have a virus and go to this site to download the fake AV to install it. Pop-ups may also have a realistic looking login screen and have you enter your credentials into it. Older Java versions can be exploited by malicious pop-ups where a Java applet is downloaded and it takes over the system. These days, pop-ups are less prevalent because your web browser blocks pop-ups by default. Mitigate using multiple layers of defense. Strong authentication measures, including multi-factor authentication and strong passwords. Promoting policies and procedures. Ensure management frequently reminds staff of policies and procedures when it comes to clicking on links and entering details into unknown websites. Education. Training users on how to recognize and prevent social engineering is the best countermeasure available. We've covered human-based and computer-based, and now we'll talk about mobile-based attacks. Second factor, authentication attack. Zitmo, or Zeus in the mobile malware, a victim would log onto their bank account and see a message saying to download an app in order to receive security messages. This app would then have access to their user credentials, sending second factor authentication requests to both the user and the attacker. Premium services. This one is hard to pull off, but it exists. An attacker would send a text message from the victim's phone to a premium service, and the attacker would delete the return SMS acknowledging the charges, and the victim would only get the bill at the end of the month with the premium services charged. Do that for all of the contacts on the phone, and now there are many users getting these bills. Publishing malicious apps. An attacker creates an app that looks like, acts like, and is named similar to a legitimate application. Repackaging legitimate apps. An attacker takes a legitimate app from the app store and modifies it to contain malware, posting it on a third party app store for download. Fake security applications. This starts with a victim PC. The attacker infects the PC with malware, then uploads a malicious app to an app store. Once the user logs in, a malware pop-up advises them to download bank security software to their phone. The user complies, thus infecting their mobile device. SMS or smishing. An attacker sends an SMS text message crafted to appear as a legitimate security notification with a phone number provided. The user unwittingly calls the number and provides sensitive data in response. I recently have received many of these smishing messages, however they have a link you can follow. This is the same thing. What did we learn? We learned about human, computer, and mobile-based social engineering attacks. Hackers have a four-phase framework that they use when social engineering. Social engineering works as it exploits hardwired human nature to help others. Education is the best defense against social engineering. Thank you for joining me for a look at social engineering. Hackers are getting more cunning. These days, knowing is half the battle, so being aware of the different threats is a great way to start mitigating against them. How many of the attacks we just looked at did you know about? Don't forget, you can contact me via email, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Have you booked your free one-on-one -on -one cybersecurity assessment? To book, visit loyalit.com.au register. 
until next time, stay safe online. Oh yeah, this is the cyber reformer. Hackers, you going down like oh yeah. This is the cyber reformer. Hackers, you going down yeah.